Well, thanks, Chris, and um, thanks for everyone for having me here. Um, it's quite interesting. We've heard a lot about the Auckland plan today and issues in Auckland, and I thought one of the most useful things I could do is try and put that in the context of what's happening nationally and how central government's thinking about national infrastructure. And um, as I was listening to what Len Brown and Ray Anderson and the team were saying today, it struck me, well, there's a lot of similarities between what I'm going to say and um, what you've already heard, and that makes a lot of sense because Auckland's obviously a key part of New Zealand's infrastructure. Um, there's also a lot of similarities in terms of the Auckland plan and the National Infrastructure Plan, which we put out last year, in the sense that it's a lot of work to produce, and you think, oh, this is really hard, and we'd consult people and come up with a plan, and then you realise the job isn't done and you have to implement it. And while Auckland Council is thinking about unitary plans and long-term planning, um, we're thinking about what we do next in terms of National Infrastructure Plan and where to from there. So today I'll briefly cover a bit of an overview about how central government is thinking about infrastructure, uh, what we did in the infrastructure plan and where we're going from here. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a preview of coming attractions of a couple of infrastructure reports we'll be putting out uh, probably at the end of September. Um, I'll touch briefly on how central government is thinking about Auckland issues. Um, I understand that the central government response to the Auckland plan is going to be formally released at the end of this week, start of next week, so I can't really preempt that, but a lot of the general thinking we're doing um, will apply to the issues in that. Um, and the other thing, I, I want to leave a good chunk of time for Q&A at the end, partly because you know, I'd like to take your questions about what Treasury, National Infrastructure Unit, the central government is thinking about, but also because I'd like to ask some questions of you and make it a bit of a two-way thing so I can get a better perspective on you know, what's actually mattering from the Auckland perspective. Happy to take clarifying questions along the way, but we should have plenty of time at the end. So just to cover it, um, where we're at with central government infrastructure's focus, I'll give you a little bit of a background of what the infrastructure unit is and um, what we've been doing. Now, there's a risk here that we're going to get into something I'd call acronym overload. If I start talking about the NIU and the NIP and the NIAB and PPPs and better business cases and, I'm sorry, BBCs, I'll try and avoid acronyms and jargon, but um, if you sit there wondering what did he just say, just wave your hand and I'll keep going. Um, to give you a bit of a history, the infrastructure unit was created in 2009. The incoming government came in and recognised that infrastructure was a key driver of economic growth. And... There's a whole lot of government agencies that care about different parts of infrastructure. Um, in the transport sector, there's the Ministry of Transport, NZTA, and of course at the local government level, people like Auckland Transport. The energy sector, um, the Ministry of Economic Development, which is now part of MBIE, and um, Commerce Commission, Electricity Authority, um, those, and MEDs, now MBIE, so there's those acronyms again, also looks at uh, communications policy. If you're working in the water sector, you're blessed with a plethora of central government agencies that care about what you do. Um, internal Affairs thinks about local government, infrastructure and assets. Um, Ministry for the Environment looks at what's actually going into the water. Ministry of Health cares about the drinking water. And one thing we found, just as part of this work, there's so many people in government who care a lot about their individual areas. Part of the, the goal of NIU is to see what's the cross-cutting issues where do you learn something interesting about the transport sector that you can apply to the energy sector? Or what's interesting in communications that also um, tells you something about, about water? Um, one thing to note about the National Infrastructure Unit, we're not a delivery agency, we're a reasonably small policy shop, so our role is really to work with others, help coordinate thinking, and, and do a lot of external engagement, really talk to local government sector, talk to the business sector, and try and see what we can learn from them and bring into the way government does things. And that fits within the wider context of Treasury's general policy role. Um, so as the government's lead economic and fiscal advisor, we're providing a lot of thinking into the business growth agenda. Um, we work directly on the policy and fiscal implications of things that are happening in the transport and communication sector in terms of the budget process. And my team works closely with Treasury's people who are working on public-private partnerships, um, capital asset management and better business cases, and there we have tentacles out into the wider public sector and some private sector people. Um, so one of the things we did last year was release the National Infrastructure Plan, which is sort of our flagship document. And a couple of things to think about, uh, talk about that plan. It's not the central government CapEx plan. We, we quite deliberately pitched it as this is looking at New Zealand's infrastructure, whether it's owned by central government, local government, private sector, um, you know, not-for-profit sector really trying to get a good understanding of how things are going. And it's not a list of projects. There are some national infrastructure plans overseas that are literally, here's what the government wants to do over the next 
20 or 30 years, and um, when you read the fine print, it's like, oh, there's 200 projects and only 50 of them are funded. So we tried to get away from that and actually set up, this is a framework to drive conversations bet between central government and local government within it about how we think about infrastructure, how we make decisions, and how we understand what's happening in some real issues. We are, um, we're not doing this on our own. Uh, we have a National Infrastructure Advisory Board, which is a group of people from outside government, private sector, bring a, or can bring a local government perspective. And they, um, they challenge us, they test us, they um, point out when we're not thinking widely enough, they help us craft our thinking, and we, um, they were instrumental in making the 2011 National Infrastructure Plan a huge improvement on the, the previous year's one, and they're also contributing to the reporting we're doing at the moment. That's chaired by Rod Carr, and um, he's been very helpful in that sense. So we, pr we produced this plan about a year ago, and since then we've been working with other agencies to implement it and use those principles in day-to-day -day work. And that's contributed to government thinking about what are the infrastructure priorities and the business growth agenda. Just, just as a question, how many people have actually read the National Infrastructure Plan? Okay, that's pretty good. How many have heard of it? Even better. I won't go through everything that is in it, but I've just got one slide that gives you kind of the highlights, the key messages, and that, that sort of informs the way we've been thinking about things. So it's a plan. You've got a plan, you've got to start off with a vision. And we came up with a vision that by 2030, we were trying to have a 20-year horizon, New Zealand's infrastructure will be resilient and coordinated and contribute to economic growth and improve quality of life. Um, there's a couple of key words in there. When we're talking about resilient, one thing we're not talking about is encase everything in concrete to earthquake-proof it. Um, you want to be resilient to natural, natural hazards, that's really important, but we're also thinking resilience in terms of these are very long-lived assets. There'll be changing demand for these infrastructure assets, there'll be changing demographics, there's lots of things that change, and we're thinking about how do you make sure your infrastructure is resilient to how it'll be used, not only now and in 10 years, but in some cases 50 and 100 years. <coughs> when we talk about coordinated, um, we recognise there's lots of players in the infrastructure sector. Um, and, and some of the conversations earlier about the Auckland Plan mentioned that central government, local government coordination and there's coordination within private sector. So I think about who's making decisions and how it all fits together. Um, obviously we're part of the Treasury, we like thinking about economic growth, how do you get the economy moving, um, how do we deliver goods to market, how do we communicate with people on the other side of the world. And that recognises that infrastructure is not just there because we like roads and cell phone towers are sexy, but they're actually there to do something. And that also ties into quality of life. People want to be able to um, well, turn on a tap and get clean drinking water or communicate with their friends and family. So when we were thinking about how to get to that vision, we thought, well, there's two real outcomes. One of them is to use the better, make a better use of the existing infrastructure you have. And that's thinking about how the assets are used, what's the whole of life costs and, and um, changes in the way that the assets will be managed, how do you think about managing demand? How do you think about users' expectations, uh, both delivering on users' expectations and thinking about are those expectations realistic for the type of asset we, we have and can afford? And then when we're thinking about new infrastructure, new investment, talking a lot about how economic infrastructure needs to actually prioritise economic growth, how it helps the export sector, and making sure that when we are investing, we're thinking about how do we get adequate returns, how do we ensure that they're underpinned by robust analysis through a well-understood and transparent process. And when you get that, you know, you've got a vision, you've got outcomes, that all sounds really good. And we, being kind of treasury black hat people, started thinking, oh, what would get in the way of that? What are the challenges? And we thought, well, okay, that's, that's kind of negative. Let's think positively. So we came up with six principles. And these are the things that, if these are done well, you know, you, you'll see them driving better infrastructure decisions. Um, they're up here. I won't go through them in detail. I'll just pull out a couple that are interesting. One is the investment analysis. That's understanding you know, why we're investing, thinking about that changes in demand I talked about. Another one that's quite important is thinking about those funding mechanisms. Uh, in the plan, the government signalled long-term investment in infrastructure, um, while also thinking about what's a broad range of funding tools. Um, and this touches on some of the things that Len Brown mentioned this morning. It's easy to think, how do we get money from the taxpayer? How do we get money from the ratepayer? But looking wider, thinking about user charges, thinking about development contributions. Not necessarily saying that you must charge for everything, but making sure that when we're making decisions, we have thought about what are different alternatives and not just going back to the usual easy ones. So that was a year ago when we released this plan, and that, that's flowed into a lot of other government thinking. So um, as the 
the, the national government came into its second term, it started talking about four key priorities. Um, and as we're thinking about how the government achieves those priorities, we've been thinking about what's the infrastructure lens on that. How do you think about it from in terms of these assets? And when we're talking about the government finances and responsibly managing them, um, the crown balance sheet, that's, that's central government, has more than doubled in size over the past decade, and there's about $115 billion, billion dollars of, of mainly social infrastructure assets on that. So again, when we're thinking about how do you responsibly manage it, it gets into the idea of how do you use those existing assets better, what are the opportunities for better management, finding better ways of looking at demand, and ensuring that, when, that we are using capital as effectively as possible and that we can reprioritise or spend on infrastructure where it delivers the highest value for money and for economic growth. And that does lead to some hard choices because there's lots of different things you can do, there's lots of things we can build. Um, with constrained resources, which applies both at central government and local, local government level, there's trade-offs and we have to understand how that works. One of the other government priorities is a more productive and competitive economy and you know, keeping the economy moving is a, is a key goal for the government and obviously Auckland as a centre of the economic growth is a key part of that. Infrastructure is one of the six streams of the business growth agenda, which I'll talk to you a little bit more, a bit more about soon. The next um, priority was delivering better public services within tight financial constraints. And I think it's kind of interesting that I, I stole the side from someone else, but we, we've highlighted the better public services rather than the tight financial constraints. And that's one of the ways we've been trying to think about assets is not just what is the asset, but what's it going to deliver. Focusing on delivering services and outcomes rather than just building something. Um, a good example of this is the Wirree Prison, which has been developed as a public-private partnership. Um, in the old days, if you're building a prison, you, you do a design and build contract and talk about, we need an asset of you know, these concrete walls and these bars and these fences. You might develop it a bit and think, and we want to run it over 25 years. Uh, the philosophy with this public-private partnership was actually, we want, a re we want rehabilitation outcomes. How do you build something to get to it? And it's just, it's just moving away from thinking about what's the asset to what are we trying to achieve with it. Uh, the next priority is rebuilding Christchurch. And this is a case where a significant amount of that city's infrastructure was um, yeah. devastated. And there's an opportunity here to really create a new city with good infrastructure behind it. But the scale of damage means you know, there's so much to do. And, and it's important here that we're thinking about what's the long term. What do we want the city to be like? Not just quickly patch up what's there. And that, that leads to some of the thinking about short term versus long term. And what are the services we want to deliver to the community and businesses. Now I mentioned before um, about the government's business growth agenda. And now, can you read that stuff with the white writing on green? Because looking at it from here, it's probably not... Okay, I'll give you the highlights because it's more to give you an idea of what's going on than to read every word on the slide. Um, the government has been talking about its business growth agenda over the last few months and it's, it's got six groups, six work streams or themes led by different ministers, Bill English and Stephen Joyce have sort of parceled it out. And there's multiple streams, there's work on building capital markets, on innovation, safe and skilled workplaces, resources, export markets and the building infrastructures theme is the one that we are most closely lined in and we are the agency leading it. Um, and that, that picks up quite a range of... Um, Portfolios, obviously the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Economic Development is in there, but also transport, communications, energy and resources, primary industries, and that's more of a sort of irrigation link, and um, building and construction, which is um, a comment we made about the National Infrastructure Plan when we put it out. We talked a lot about social housing, but not the wider housing sector. Uh, now that we're linked in more with building and construction side of things, we're, we're trying to understand that aspect a bit more too. And... Um, so the government talked about the business growth agenda and released it, and a lot of these streams of work started to come together for the first time. In a way, infrastructure had a head start. Because we'd worked on the plan over the previous year or two, we'd actually been having the key agencies working together. We had a policy work stream, and we were thinking about implementations. What being part of this has given us, though, is a chance to connect with some of these other business-facing areas of work, and um, it helps us compare progress. Uh, when the government released this, they had a list of 120 points of action. And um, what struck me when I was actually looking at them is about 30 of them, like a quarter of them, were infrastructure related. Quite helpfully, about half of them actually completed, so yeah, job done. Um, ministers are looking at those, those points of action on a sort of monthly basis, just taking track. But one of the things we're trying to do is, is make this more than just let's check the boxes and see if we've 
we've delivered another kilometre of our runs this week. It's, it's more about how does central government work together, how does it work with local government, what are some of the cross-cutting issues, say, in the regulatory side of things or the competition side that we can, um, we can talk about and understand. And, and I keep coming back to, and how do we learn what matters for the business sector or the local government sector? You know, what do you guys care about? Because that, that should affect what the government thinks about. Um, so the, the business growth agenda actually fits quite well into the, the kind of evolution of where our national infrastructure thinking has been going. And I pitch it as an evolution because the plan um, we launched last year isn't the first national infrastructure plan. Uh, when NIU was relatively new, we produced a plan in 2010, and that was, that was a stock take. I mean, it basically looked at what was going on at the time and, and tried to tell a story about what the immediate priorities for investment were. And on, on the positive side, that was the first time I think someone had looked across the whole of those various infrastructure spheres and put them together in one place. Uh, on the other hand, one of the comments we got was, oh, is that all? What's next? So when we did the second plan, we actually quite deliberately took a 20-year focus, trying to lengthen the horizon, trying to think about those cross-cutting challenges and priorities and, and where we'd go to from there. And I think where we got to, we got quite a good response from it. Um, Interesting some of the feedback. One was, oh, that, that, that's, you've asked some really good questions there. Where are the answers? Um, and actually, nice summary. We'd like to see some of the detail. So we, we came to the conclusion that there's not a lot of point writing a plan every year. Basically, you spend all your time writing a plan. So we thought, OK, we'll do the next plan three years out in 2014. And our goal is to make sure that's got a more of a, a robust, evidence-based, stronger performance measures and tell a bit more of a sophisticated story. And I'd, I'd like to think that you know, we're starting off a good base, we're moving up and we're going to continue improving. But that, that does put a lot of work on us in the next three years. And it's not just the National Infrastructure Unit, it's other government agencies and people in the private sector. So when you look at our action plan, we talk a lot about partnerships. We talk about working with other agencies, we talk about research, and we talk about reporting. Because we don't just want to produce a plan every three years and go quiet in between. So we have um, quite heroically committed to do two reports in September this year. And this is the, these are the reports I'm going to talk to you about in a bit more detail. So one of them is a national state of, state of infrastructure report. And we said, we'll come back a year after the plan and talk about where we've come to. The other report is the infrastructure strand of the business growth agenda. And to be honest, we went through a bit of back and forth about, there, is there one report, are there two reports? Do they happen together? Do they happen separately? Because they've got slightly different goals and slightly different authors, but are all unified with the one um, infrastructure theme. So that gives you a bit of the history, where we've come from, and now I'll just move on to what will be in those um, September reports. Um, treat it as a bit of a preview of coming attractions. You won't get all the detail, but hopefully it'll spark a bit of interest, and if you want to get them, well, I'll tell you where our website is at the end. So with the National State of Infrastructure Report, which has the awful acronym NSER, um, we want to show that journey, where we've come from the previous plan and where we're heading forward. We want to highlight some achievements, and that's not just central government saying, God, we're wonderful, we've built these roads and these bridges and rolled out this infrastructure network of broad, um, ultra-fast broadband. We do want to make it what, what's actually happened over the last year across multiple sectors. And, but also we want to highlight what are, the, what are the challenges we still have, what are the priorities ahead. And we want to keep the ideas we were talking about in the plan on people's agenda. So we want to d generate some debate, some further discussion. And part of what helps us do that, or I'm hoping will help us do this, is the think pieces by that National Infrastructure Advisory Board I mentioned earlier. And we've characterised these as kind of op-ed pieces. So, you know, Treasury and, and other agencies will do the factual, this is, this is what the government's done, this is where we're heading. We've asked NIAB to to come in at more, if, if you wanted to spur a debate about infrastructure, about what's important, about what are the challenges, what are some of the tricky trade-offs, come up with a couple of one or two page, effectively, articles on, on that sort of thing. And um, funnily enough, when you look at the titles, it, it's a bit of a tale of two cities. There's a bit of Christchurch stuff there, both about the rebuild of the um, infrastructure from the earthquake and also irrigation, which is primarily a Canterbury issue. Uh, and the risk management and resilience and insurance comes out of what's happened in Christchurch, but obviously has wider applications for the rest of the country. On the Auckland side, um, NIAB will talk about transport investment and aligning it with planning. Now, this is 
It's quite separate from the government's response to the Auckland plan. However, it covers a lot of the same territory because that is thinking about how you align, how you use the land with what the infrastructure is and what the population is going to change and do. Um, and thinking about how do you integrate transport and price it to support population and economic growth needs where required. And that, that leads into a net, another piece on demand management. And again, it's thinking about network optimization and, and whether there are road pricing tools like some of the ones that um, Mayor Brown talked about or other things that people should be thinking about. And it's not necessarily advocating you must do this, but it's saying here's something you think about. How do you think about dynamic pricing? And what is the public appetite? What are people willing to consider in their area? So that's the front end. That'll be the first part of the report. In the plan, as I said, we, there were a lot of things we did in the 2011 plan, a lot of things we thought we'd really like to do by 2014. And we actually set out for ourselves a three-year action plan, which we're now one year into. And we've done a bit of a report card on ourselves, just trying to say, well, what if we really pushed, and what if we only started pushing, and what haven't we really done? I'm just going to take you briefly through what were the, the eight the eight things in our program of action from the NIU perspective, which is more what my unit is doing rather than what wider government's doing, but obviously we're collaborating with others, and tell you where we're going to on that. So one of the things we said we'd do is start thinking about central government infrastructure on a 10-year horizon. And we were struck by the irony that central government requires local government to do 10-year LTPs, where we've tended to think more about the three- or four-year budget horizon. Um, Treasury's actually been collecting 10-year planning information uh, about or at least the top sort of 15 or 16 most capital intensive government agencies for a while. So we want to start reporting on that. And where we're at the moment is we've looked at that existing collection and think about how do, we, how do we collect that in a slightly better way for uh, reporting to the public? And how do we go beyond that? So we want to pull information out of LTP so we can tell a central government, local government story. And we're talking with colleagues in the private sector about what are they doing over the next um, 10 years to try and pull that picture together. And that's something that we've made a good start on and are looking to publish probably next year. In the plan, we talked about demand management and pricing and thinking about not pushing a scheme because we're a policy agency, we don't have a delivery angle, we're not trying to actually produce something, but we want to just change the public debate and make sure people are understanding how much they pay for various infrastructure assets, whether it's hidden in the bottom of the rates bill that they pay this much for stormwater or... Um, they're paying it in their fuel excise duty or something, just understanding what are we paying and how might you pay for it differently or how do you value it differently. We have two streams of work. Oh, I'm sorry, and just to explain the colour coding, this is one where we've started some of the conversations. We're working with NZTA and Ministry of Transport trying to understand how it works in the, in the um, transport sector. We're starting to think about how it applies in water. Um, so we've started it. I'd say it's one we're, we're moving towards. The next two I linked together, which is performance information and performance indicators, and making sure there's more information available. Something that struck us in trying to produce a national infrastructure plan is that it's really hard work. Most agencies have a good idea of what's happening with their own assets, and they might have a good idea of what's happening in sort of a neighbour's asset in a similar industry or similar area. But trying to get a national picture of what's New Zealand's infrastructure like, it wasn't easy. And um, those of you who read the plan know that we sort of resorted to some three-point traffic lighty scales to rate each sector, which got interesting feedback. And we, it struck us, we need a better performance information base. And again, we've looked at what overseas examples have done, and there tends to be a bit of a, let's grab the top 200 indicators we can think at and put them in one report, which we thought, well, that's, that's not quite useful at a 200 indicator stage. So what we're trying to do is work with, work with some partner agents. Think, what, are, what are the handful, the five or six indicators that really tell you how a sector's going? And we're starting that work thinking about the transport and energy sector. And once we've piloted that, um, we'll roll it out to communications and, and um, water and social infrastructure. So that's something we're um, aiming to have better information for next year and for the next um, plan. We talked a lot about strategic infrastructure planning in the, in the plan and thinking at the regional level and something we called the macro regional level, which aligns with sort of upper North Island. Um, our main focus recently, frankly, has been part of the government's um, response to the Auckland plan, and part of my, some people in my team have been part of those conversations that um, Ree Anderson was talking about before. And we've also got people working uh, with Sarah and the Christchurch City Council on what's happening in the Christchurch CBD area, the uh, Canopy area. Um, and I think those examples have shown the, the benefits of the coordination between central and local government sector and, and 
how much spatial planning can help when you're thinking about things. So um, I think we've made some progress there, but again, we're keen to see where we can go further on that. One of the things that we wanted to do and haven't really made as much of a, a focus on this year as we will in the future is scenario modelling. And I noticed um, Lynn over there raised the question of how do, you, how do you know what's happening 20, 30, 40 years in the future? And our goal with that is not to try and crystal ball gaze. We're not saying we're going to predict what's happening in 2030 or 2050, but we're more trying to think, well, what are the things that might change that will have significant impacts? If, if they happen in now, what will they mean further out? And we're drawing a lot on some NZTA work, um, which they called megatrends, just to try and think about that. And we're developing that with our um, performance indicators work, but that's um, something we're really yet to get our teeth into. We also talked a bit about resilience in the plan, and as I said, it's not just natural hazards. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work happening at the central government level, thinking about what can you learn, what are the lessons from Christchurch and Canterbury, and where do you go to from here? Um, NIU has seen its role as kind of being an agency that, that cares about this across multiple sectors, and we've been coordinating a group of other agencies, bring them together, trying to think, what are we learning? What do you know now that we didn't know a year or two years ago? And what does that mean for how you design and build um, infrastructure in the future? And the last piece of work, and another one that is twinned with demand management a bit, is thinking about what are those alternative sources of funding. Um, it's quite a complicated area. Um, we found the Auckland Council consultation discussion document that um, was mentioned earlier to be quite a, an interesting way of exploring this. And, and it does show the range of alternative funding tools that might be available, but also the range of issues and problems, or issues and um, things you have to work through to make them work. So again, another area we're keen to dig into. So when I look at that as a report card, it says, oh yeah, we've made good progress on three, we're, we're getting there on, on four and there's another one to go. So for one year into a three year plan, we think we've made some progress. We've still got a lot to do and we're gonna keep working on it. The other part of this report that um, you'll be seeing in a couple of months is an overview of just what's happening in each of the key infrastructure sectors. And we're sort of treating this as a bit of an 80% look back, what's happened in the last year. And again, not just what a central government done, but you know, what's happened widely. And also 20% looking forward, what are, what are still the challenges, what are the issues? Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of what's in here. Obviously, it's a quite a chunky report, but in the transport sector, you know, we're talking about what's happened in the government policy statement on land transport funding thinking about what are the significant transport projects that have either started or are progressing, including things like the roads of national significance, what's happening with the Kiwi Rail turnaround plan. Um, some of the more wider issues, like streamlined consenting process, what's that meant for Waterview, what it means for um, Transmission Gully down in Wellington, uh, and how much coordination and um, increasing coordination can reduce uncertainty and, and, and help work our way through sort of the regulatory compliance there. Uh, we're quite interested in work sort of in the, the multimodal space about, say, the Upper North Island, how, the, how we're looking at that um, as a freight, freight network, how we're looking at that as a transport network. So there's quite a lot going on. In the telecommunications area, obviously the big thing is the ultra-fast broadband initiative and rural broadband. Um, there's also some work at the moment on, now that we're doing the digital switchover from television, it frees up the 700 megahertz spectrum and there'll be an auction towards the end of this year, starting next year, and the, the question there is, how do you use that spectrum to deliver 4G services and, and better communications? In the energy sector, there's a couple of strategic documents came out recently, energy strategy and energy efficiency and conservation strategy. There's also been quite a lot of investment in um, electricity transmission grid and uh, some work on gas transmission investment program. So we'll talk through briefly what's happening in there. The water sector, as I indicated before, we're talking about the range of agencies, it's quite a complicated sector, this local government. There's um, more the rural irrigation side of things. We'll talk a bit about where the RMA changes are going and also some of the progress on the Irrigation Acceleration Fund. And when we're talking about social infrastructure, we've done a, a bit of a stock take of um, 13, again, central government capital intensive agencies, thinking about how they manage their assets. And one of the messages we get when we think about that is there's a lot central government can learn from local government. Um, so we're, we're building on that and we're continuing working on the better business cases work and rolling that out, both in central government agencies, but there's also been conversations with Auckland Council and Christchurch Council and some of the wider people about that. Um, continuing that kind of tale of two cities metaphor, we'll also have a little bit about what's happening in Auckland and Christchurch as part of the, the overview. 
So that's our National State of Infrastructure report. The second report I mentioned is the Business Growth Agenda. And you'll see we've come up with a cutesy logo of six hexagons because there's six streams of work. Uh, the idea is the government would like to publish one of those pretty much once a month between now and the end of the year. And I think innovation and capital markets are one of the first ones that will be coming out soon. In addition, uh, there'll be some reporting on a bit of a regional perspective and also a sector perspective. Uh, the report that my team's involved in is the Infrastructure Sector Report, again coming out in September, and that'll talk about the 120 points of action that apply to infrastructure, as of which I said there's about 30 of them. Um, most of those have made some good progress, some are on the ramping up stage, uh, but also, as I said, we're keen to go beyond that and, and, and tie it into the National Infrastructure Plan themes of how you think about infrastructure, rather than it just being a list of projects. So that's kind of what central government's thinking about what we're reporting on. Um, I'll now just talk to you a little bit about Auckland issues. Um, one thing that struck us when we're pulling together these reports is what's happened over the last year. As I said, we're trying to do a report card. So we looked at what has happened in Auckland. And in the transport sector, there's been a lot of work on the local roads and highways. There's the Metro Rail Electrical Multiple Units in the new <coughs> depot. There's a variety of public transport initiatives um, and investment. Victoria Park Tunnel, obviously Waterview is consented. There's been significant investment in the water and wastewater area um, through water care and, you know, in the local authority area. And I mentioned some of the grid upgrades. There's obviously there's a North Island grid upgrade. There's also work in the um, north of Auckland and Northland. Um, we found it quite interesting just looking at what the social infrastructure had been. Um, I mentioned the, the Wirree Prison Public-Private Partnership. There's also a public-private partnership um, in Hobsonville Schools. And again, the goal there isn't necessarily to get the private sector to build a prison because they've got more money. It's more, can they think about how you'd run something more efficiently and, and, and can we as central government actually learn from that and apply it to the wider sector. Um, and again, going through the list, just, just sounding out other agencies what's going on. You know, we've heard about lots of early childhood education places, some upgrades and renewals in the sort of courts and justice sector and housing area. Um, Ultra-fast broadband, obviously, it's a national rollout, but I understand in Auckland they're starting in Avondale and Albany. I don't think they're doing them alphabetically, but um, if you live in those two areas, it sounds like you're going to be one of the first people to get them. Five minutes, excellent. Um, and then some of the Auckland issues, obviously the Auckland plan is dominating a lot of people's thinking. And as I said, central government response is coming out at the end of this week. Um, so I won't preempt that too much, but just to talk about how National Infrastructure Unit and, and my team is thinking about it, one thing we've quite focused on is the programme as a whole. Um, you know, we've heard about the City Rail link and that's important, but you know, our team is part of thinking about central city access more generally, thinking about what the, that 30-year transport plan is, um, both central government and local government are looking at what is the funding gap? If you wanted to do all the things in this plan, how do you think about them? How, how do you rank them? Which ones are more important? Uh, which ones are, are more tied into central government objectives and living within those fiscal constraints is, is important for both central and local government. And it ties into how do you think about better local government, um, so some of the reforms there, the better public services reforms, how, just thinking about how government itself does things, and better business cases, how do we make sure we're making more, more robust decisions and, and, and using good analysis to make sure that where we are putting our money is the, um, the highest value, highest return way of doing it. Something that um, has come up a bit is that, yes, this is the Auckland Infrastructure Forum, but Auckland is part of the Upper North Island, and there's a lot going on. I, I stole this from the National Infrastructure Plan. Um, it was one of our, just looking at what's happening around the country. And again, I don't know if you can read the writing, but just to tell you some of the story we were talking about here, the sort of blue circles with the upwards arrows are showing where the population growth is. And we keep hearing a lot about the Golden Triangle, Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, and we've kind of extended it up north into Northland to pick up the port and the, the transport infrastructure up there. But thinking wider in Upper North Island, if you look over sort of the east coast, um, that's where infrastructure is, well, sorry, that's where population is projected to decline over the next 30 years. And that brings up all sorts of interesting issues about are you building for you know, the peak of population growth or what the residual will be and, and how do you deal with the changes in there? Um, 
also thinking about land use and the, the farming community and how it all works together. Um, and that's where things like the Upper North Island Strategic Alliance and um, also what NZTA is doing in an um, Upper North Island freight strategy, it's quite important thinking not just Auckland as a city or Auckland as a super city, but Auckland as part of a wider region. Um, and, and what's interesting is that some of the sort of collective thinking that seems to start in the Upper North Island, uh, we're hearing about now in sort of Lower North Island, Upper South Island and, and South Island, but people are thinking more widely and collectively. So I think that's something encouraging because it, it ties to that coordination point we were making earlier. So that's what I was keen to talk about myself, just try and give you that list of you know, what, what central government focused on, where have we come from the National Infrastructure Plan, where are we going in reporting, and some of the things we're talking about with Auckland. Thank <music> you.